our next speaker is Shaz Atari. And uh, quick introduction. You wrote a paper that helps support something my beatnik hippie grandmother always used to say about um, toilet flushing behavior. And the saying was, if it's yellow, yellow, yellow let it it's mellow. Yellow. If it's brown, it's brown. flush it out. Yeah. And there's scientific justification for that. As well. <laughs> but I'm not going to be talking about that today. So you can feel free to ask me about that over lunch. <laughs> um, so some of you um, uh, might have remembered this talk. I, I was invited to come to UC Boulder a couple of months ago. So this is sort of, I'm going to be talking about the first paper that you've already seen. Uh, some of you, and then I'm going to give you an update based on some of the feedback that I received from you, and I've run some new studies based on that. Leif, thank you for inviting me, because I, and I think the pairing is, is wonderful, because all I'll be talking about today is hypocrisy. Um, here we go. So what are ad hominem attacks? So ad hominem basically means, in Latin, to the person. So these are attacks that are used in almost every controversy, sometimes justifiably so. So for example, would you take dieting advice from an overweight doctor? Or if a doctor that smokes that tells you to stop smoking, would you listen to them? Uh, climate change deni deniers are often ex uh, accused of financial conflicts of interest. And uh, climate change scientists are also accused of uh, financial con conflicts of interest. Um, We've talked a lot about poor Al Gore today, so let me add to the fire. Um, in, uh, in 2006, there was a press release uh, from the Tennessee Center that basically attacked Al Gore. This, these attacks have continued, as we've seen more recently. Uh, he devoured nearly 20 times the national average in terms of energy use. Following that, uh, James Einhoff basically uh, forced or tried to force uh, Al Gore to sign a personal energy ethics pledge that he refused to do so. So then the question is, He's uh, sort of a great climate change communicator, but how does his personal carbon footprint impact the credibility of his advice, okay, the, the credibility of his communication? There's also been a lot of research within the climate change community about uh, climate researchers' large carbon footprints. Uh, the Tyndall Center in 2015 released a white paper that basically said academic researchers are among the highest emitters uh, in terms of individuals, primarily due to flying to conferences, project meetings, and field work. I must confess, I do work in Zambia and Kenya, so I fly there, I flew here. So now we can, we can talk about it later, how that affects the credibility of what you're listening to right now. Um, uh, they also argue that the research community needs a roadmap to reduce its own emissions following government targets, and ironically, that are based on the findings of the research community. <laughs> Uh, there was an editorial in Nature magazine in 2015 basically saying that lots of seemingly small <coughs> actions can have an effect, so we really need to not, we need to fo focus both on policies, but we also need to start focusing on individual actions. There have also been a few climate researchers that have given up flying altogether. Uh, I don't know how they do it, but here are two examples. Uh, both Peter Kalmus as well as Eric Holthaus, who's a, a, um, who's a journalist, they, they uh, computed their own carbon footprint and they basically found that the largest proportion of their carbon footprint was from air travel, flying to conferences and meetings. So they basically gave up flying. The question is how do academics, how should academics do it? So the first paper I'll be talking to you about um, was published uh, in 2016 in Climatic Change, looking at statements about climate researchers' carbon footprints affecting their credibility and the impact of their advice. So the study design, uh, we basically had a variety of experimental vignettes. This was uh, run online through Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Um, let me just walk you through what we did in the study. So as a participant entered the survey, they basically <laughs> saw a vignette that was common across all of the different um, experimental arms. You're attending a talk by a leading climate researcher. He, she has been publishing scholarly articles in the field of climate science since 1974. This is actually um, designed around uh, one of my own climate heroes, Jim Hansen. So I basically looked at his CV and then I figured out. So anyways, um, sorry, a nerdy backstory. Um, the researcher explains how an individual's actions can collectively have a large impact on the environment. They give examples of these actions, such as air travel, amount of energy used in the home. Um, they explain how these actions can have. Uh, near the end of the talk, the researcher gives advice to the audience on how they can reduce their own energy use. 
So that, that's the common part of the vignette. And then we had a variety of these different uh, continuations. The first was high fly. So you later find out that the researcher flew across the country to the talk you attended, like me, and that they regularly fly to lectures and conferences all over the world. And then we had two variations, male and female, as you can tell, female. So I wanted to know what the effect was of a female communicator versus a male communicator. The second version was low fly, so they don't fly as much. Uh, the, third, uh, the fifth version was offset, so they regularly buy carbon offsets to offset their flying. High home, so you later find out that the researcher consumes a lot of energy in their home. They have a high cooling and heating bill. And low home, they have a very low heating and cooling bill. So those are the uh, uh, variety of vignettes that we explored. Right after the participants saw the vignette, they were asked for their immediate thoughts about the research presented and the researcher's own behavior. And then they were asked to um, uh, whether or not they would be willing to uh, endorse or um, uh, endorse some of these behaviors. Would they be willing to fly less, use less energy in their home, take public transit, think about changing some actions, they already do it, change no actions or other. So we just look at, looked at the top three of these, flying less, uh, less home energy use and public transportation. We then uh, created a credibility score. We had six different statements and we asked participants whether they strongly agreed or disagreed on all of these statements. So some examples were, um, I believe that the researcher's ad advocacy is sincere, I believe that the researcher has good reasons for their behavior, so on and so forth. So this made up a credibility score for each and every one of our <coughs> participants. Towards the end of the survey, we had questions about um, climate change. So how important is the issue of climate change to you? Uh, do you think climate change is happening? How sure are you that it's happening? Political part, uh, uh, um, we had a, a, a question about political <coughs> party affiliation and demographics. So these are the results. So let me walk you through this. So the credibility score ranged from negative one, which was very low credibility, to one, very high credibility. Um, high fly. So the relatively low credibility, but the good news is um, male and female researchers are roughly the same. Similarly for low fly, male and female researchers are the same, but much higher credibility than high fly. Um, offsets is kind of in the middle of high fly and low fly, so offsets does not wipe the slate clean. So if you guys are buying offsets, please continue to do so, but you need to think about other ways to sort of uh, uh, recharge, and I'll talk about that towards the end. The biggest difference that we found was high home versus low home. Um, so ha consuming a lot of energy in the home really wipes out your credibility. And that makes <coughs> sense to me in terms of um, sort of post hoc explanation, which is I might not have that much control over how much I fly, mm -hmm. but I have a lot more control over my own home's energy footprint. Uh, so why did we have a, a follow-up survey? We thought that maybe asking these open-ended questions about what do you think about the researcher and the research provided might have really primed participants into thinking about um, this hypocrisy. So we got rid of this open-ended question. We also wanted a much more natural way of the high carbon footprint to come out from the, the talk. So for example, I've been to talks very similar to this one, where at the end of the talk someone asked me, hey, you know, you're talking about energy use, uh, this is some of my other research, uh, but you flew here, so why should I listen to anything you say? So it's like an audience lead-in question. So we wanted to test whether an audience lead-in question would make a difference versus me just telling you that, that, this, that, that this particular researcher flew to this conference. So in survey two, we had 11 variations. We replicated one through five. We just removed the female versions because female and male were the same. And then we, ha we added in all of these audience question lead-in. So during the question period, a member of the audience asked the researcher whether he flew across the country to give the talk. And he replies that he regularly flies to lectures and conferences all over the world. Low fly, audience question lead-in, high, high home, AQ, low home, and so on and so forth. And we were really surprised by the uh, offset uh, um, value that we got. So we wanted to make sure that um, a lot of people claim that the offset market is a buyer beware market. Like you can buy offsets for anything from like a dollar per ton CO2 to $50 per ton CO2. So we wanted to make sure that the participants knew that these offsets were really um, uh, vigorously uh, chosen and they were effective. So we had two separate versions for um, offsets as well. Here are the, the results. So uh, complete replication for, for the first study. So I'm just gonna talk to you about um, offsets and then home. So as you can tell, like carefully choosing the offset doesn't make as much of a difference. Offsets are offsets, that's what we find. 
What we do find is that the audience question lead-in, this naturalistic form of asking the question, actually softens the blow from both sides. So that's actually good news, but the thing is, it's still significantly, this is huge significant gap in between um, high home, uh, uh, so the, the credibility for researchers who have high home energy consumption versus low home energy consumption. So that's really still very, very surprising. And uh, we need to figure out how to solve this problem. What we find is uh, this problem persists for people that believe that climate change is, imp is an important problem, as well as people who believe that climate change is not an important problem. So it's not that this problem just exists for people who are climate change deniers. Um, and that's, we find a similar pattern between uh, people who think it's very important, as well as people who do not think it's very important. In terms of trying to predict uh, researcher credibility, conservatives tend to trust less. Trust increases with climate change importance. Trust increase, increases with climate change belief, and male, tends, male, ten, male participants tend to trust more. Uh, what's amazing is that this really correlates strongly with intention to incorporate some of these behaviors in your own life. So over here on the x-axis, you have researcher credi credibility, negative one to one. And on the y-axis, you have proportion of our participants intending to conserve energy. It's the strongest for safe home energy, less for fly less, and less for public transport. And what this means is, is that as researcher credibility increases, you're much more likely to, dec to be willing to say, all right, I'm going to try to decrease my home energy use. So, and these are sort of a, um, very strong um, findings as well. So in summary from the first paper, ad hominem attacks based on personal energy use for a climate researcher can be highly effective. Uh, especially for home energy use. Differences in credibility strongly affect participants' inclination to change their own energy use behavior, especially for home energy use again. The gender of the climate researcher doesn't matter. Perceived, actually buying these carbon offsets does not wipe the slate clean for researchers. The effect of credibility on intentions to save energy occurs strongly for varied audiences, both liber liberals and conservatives, as well as people who believe climate change is very important and, as well, uh, and those that do not. So that sort of led me to a lot of different questions to consider, and I'm just going to focus on the last two, and these are sort of um, new, new, uh, new studies that we ran. So what about a researcher recommending a particular policy, uh, as opposed to individual behavior change? So um, uh, one of my co-authors, Dave Prance, and I, we had completely different hypotheses for what we would find here. So I thought, all right, maybe a researcher prefers to actually um, make policy recommendations rather than talk about individual behavior because I'm protecting myself. I mean, you know, yes, I flew here, but you know, a carbon tax is a really great idea in terms of trying to make sure that the entire system moves towards a stabilizing CO2 concentration. He actually said, no, we basically find the same thing. So I'm gonna show you the results from that. And then can the slate wi be wiped clean by, rec uh, by a recommender decreasing their carbon footprint? So we know that offsets do not wipe the slate clean. So are there other ways that we can wipe the slate clean? Um, so we, I'm glad that you showed some of these quotes, but uh, when our first paper came out, uh, lots of uh, reporters talked to climate researchers and they asked them to justify all of their behaviors and I felt really bad about this. <laughs> so uh, so um, uh, a, f a famous climate researcher, Michael Mann, basically was, on the, uh, was put on the spot after our paper came out and he said, personal responsibility plays a role, but any real solution is going to require policy change at the highest level, including a price on carbon. So it's sort of a, a good impetus for us to study this, this uh, the second phenomenon. So the current work that I'd like to talk to you about is the impact of carbon footprint on policy acceptance or policy support and reforming behavior. So the policy support study, we basically had um, 12 randomly assigned vignettes and we tested policy support for six separate policies. Um, the first was um, CCS, which is carbon capture and storage. So regulating carbon dioxide as a pollutant, capturing it at at the power plant, putting it into underground aquifers, um, having a carbon tax, increasing nuclear power, stabilizing human population, uh, increasing renewable energy support, and increasing public transit. All of these were followed by either a high home or a low home energy footprint uh, vignette. So here are the results. It's the first time I'm showing it to a public audience. I just made this graph in R like a couple of weeks ago, so let me know what you think. Over here you have strongly oppose all the way to strongly support, and you have condition, 
uh, on the y on the x-axis. L means low carbon footprint. H means high carbon footprint. Um, let me walk you through the general findings first, and then we'll get into the details. People really don't like population stabilization. No surprise there. People really like renewable uh, uh, re renewable energy. So as you can as you can see, there's a positive trend. Uh, what you notice is this is this jagger in the data. For a low carbon footprint, you have higher support than you do for a high carbon footprint. And this is common across all of these different policies except for renewable energy. And one hypothesis that we have is that there's so much overwhelming support for renewable energy that it drowns out the, the credibility requirement. So how do we deal with this? This is a, uh, as I said, all of these are, are statistically significant except for renewable. Uh, pretty strong finding across a variety of different uh, policies that have a variety of different attributes. We actually picked these based on um, interviews that I did with uh, environmental policy uh, researchers. A lot of them love carbon tax, but we wanted to get a, a good range. Um, so I'd love to talk to you about this if you have any ideas on how to deal with it. Uh, how does, credi how does cred credibility, the distribution of credibility, change for high carbon footprint versus low carbon footprint? So as you can see, for high home energy use, um, you have sort of a, a, a somewhat normal distribution, but for low home energy use, you have a lot of people shifting to extremes. And what do I mean by that? So you have a lot of people going from, uh, 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 from sort of a, a moderate view to sort of I strongly uh, agree or strongly disagree with a particular, uh, with, with a particular research credibility statement. So that, the, the, the changes in distribution is also very surprising to us. So how do we solve this problem? One way is to sort of reform our own behavior. Um, we tested three separate levels of reformation, no reform, some reform, and complete reform. And we looked at two separate areas for carbon footprint, flying and home energy use. Um, so what did we do? Uh, we had uh, these, these, again, <coughs> same vignettes followed by no reformation. You later find out that the researcher flew across the country and regularly flies. Some, refor some reformation, you later find out that the researcher used to fly but he now flies only twice a year, and then he video conferences. And complete reformation, which is the, the, exa the two examples that I gave you earlier, that he's now completely given up flying. And here's what we find. So no reformation is very similar to the high, high carbon footprint. Um, complete reformation and some reformation starts looking a lot more like the low carbon footprint. So what the good news is, if you stop emitting your CO2 right now, it's kind of like you've always had this low carbon footprint all the entire time. Um, but the question is, how should we do that, given a lot of us fly, a lot of us uh, travel as much as we do? So that's the open question for this community, and I, and I hope we can sort of talk about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So in terms of summary, ad hominem attacks based on personal energy use of a climate researcher, especially home energy use, can be highly effective. High home energy use decreases policy support. It decreases intention to act. So in terms of all of the different parts of your carbon footprint that you can change, if you are a climate communicator, try to change that one and try to get after the most effective behaviors. And the credibility slate can be wiped clean by climate researchers decreasing their carbon footprint. Um, with that, acknowledgments. Uh, uh, funding was provided by IU and NSF. Thanks to a lot of the comments that I received from, uh, from Boulder a couple of months ago. You guys inspired the, the policy study, so thank you for that. And I open it up to questions. Thanks. I, just a quick clarifying question. Did the manipulations of credibility, uh, or sorry, the, yeah, the, did the manipulations of oh, credibility- Carbon like, footprint. Yeah, that's right. And did that affect um, intentions? Yeah. So it did. Okay, because there was a correlation. Yeah. You showed the correlation. Yeah, there. yeah. So it okay. strongly affects intention. So the thing is, okay. this is a this so entire correlation. So low credibility, then people say, I'm not even going to bother now. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. And that was the upward line uh, for, uh, I can show it to you. That was later. the correlation. Though. Yeah. That That's was. That, so that was basically the correlation. So it's. Um, but did the manipulation actually affect that outcome? Uh, so. So we know that the manipulation affects credibility, and we yeah. know that credibility affects intentions. Credibility is correlated with intentions, yeah. but it's a yeah. different question. So you're, you're asking whether credibility... No, uh, I'm asking whether the manipulations affected people's intentions to engage in the environmental behavior. 
these different bees. The correlation yeah. can be affected by any number of you know other things. So. Um, so the one thing I will say that we're uh, looking at right now is a question that's related to that, and some people have been talking about this before. Is does the does the manipulation affect belief in climate change? But I think we can add add the question that so for example, if I if I am a high carbon footprint communicator, mm -hmm. does that actually change your belief in climate change or not? Yeah. Similar to the local warming. I'm just wondering if like hearing hearing you know someone preach about environmentalism, but mm -hmm. then I find out oh, this person's flying all over. They have a heavy carbon footprint. Does that decrease my uh, my own personal intentions to engage yeah. in environmental behavior? And yeah. I, you probably have that. Data, we right? have that data, but okay. we haven't looked at it. Okay. That. Yeah. I'm, my name's Brett and Karen. I'm with the city of Boulder. I'm the senior climate and sustainable reporting. So this is very interesting for us today. I'm with my colleague, Bella Abernathy, who is a lot on the ecological side. And uh, you made my day. You've actually given me uh, exactly what I need because you know Boulder has 3,000 climate scientists. We are about to actually uh, release a new um, program which offers people roadmaps in their own personal households to achieving a renewable lifestyle. We've needed the validation of how it was for our climate scientists to be leaders in that adoption stage. So thank you for that. You just made my day. So <laughs> <laughs> All right. My, so, my research has actually been useful somehow. So I also, also just want to note that this issue of hypocrisy is um, of enormous significance. In our community, we did some focus group and survey work, and we found that across the spectrum, <coughs> which in Boulder doesn't go from I don't believe in climate change to I do, but from I don't believe in the efficacy of climate action to I do. The one prevailing common belief was that we have become a hypocritical community and therefore I don't see why I should act when others aren't taking action. So this issue of the social norms of action and the prevailing social narrative that is eroding the sense that people are taking action and that we should act together is enormously significant. That's great. Thank you for that comment. Um, that's great. Take one more shot. Um, yeah. that's, that's kind of related to a question I had about both of these presentations because the way in which the environment is really different from health is on who gets the benefits of your action, right? If you take health action, presumably you're primarily the person who like lives longer. Whereas with environmental action, you know, you reduce your carbon footprint, you pay the costs, but like everybody around you gets the benefits. Right, and so I wondered how that might affect, like, both sort of the size of this, like, what's going on with hypocrisy, but also could be sort of a little bit at the root of um, some of you know your findings, where there's a difference between the things that are under your control, your household behaviors, right, and the things that are your professional capacity that are sort of you can excuse yourself from as well. And so I, there's sort of like two two really interesting things going on between this difference and then those two. No, no. That's really a question. Uh, yeah, I don't think that's a, that's a question, but yeah, I, I agree. Sounds like a lunch conversation. <laughs> it's yeah, a lunch conversation. yeah. Uh, actually, but the one thing I will say is I, um, it seems like a no-brainer, right, that if you're a climate communicator, people want you to uh, practice what you preach. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I will say was surprising to us with this finding was the size of the effect and the fact that it's different for flying versus home. Like I, th I mean, a lot of the a lot of the Tyndall Center papers don't actually talk that much about the home. And if you look at the, if you look at a climate researcher's actual carbon footprint, home doesn't dominate. Flying dominates. Mm. But people really judge you based on mm. home rather than flying. And I think that that is a surprise finding, both in perceptions versus actual, but also what is required to to preach. Because even if you look at the the way the policy, the Tennessee Policy Center attacked Al Gore was his home, not how much he flies. And so I think that there's sort of, um, I think climate communicators actually probably need to go that extra step to first say, hey, our carbon footprint is this, and the real big chunk is flying, not the home. But then it's a role, but then, how, but then the other question that I would suggest that we ask ourselves, in my humble opinion, is that how much of our flying is actually required? But it's very hard because everyone can easily, it's motivated reasoning. I really need to be here. So anyways, thank you so much. Thank you.